All right, what's up guys? During these pandemic times, do you find yourself having way too much money or do you like hobbies that are incredibly frustrating and only very rarely rewarding? Well, if you do, stick around because we're gonna talk about something that satisfies both of those criteria today and that's astrophotography. So this is actually a video that I've had requested quite a bit. And before you click off of this video because it's not a large format video and you go off and watch Ben Horn, this camera back here is actually marketed as a large format astrophotography camera. So it is on brand for the channel. So you can keep watching. Um, I've done this three times and there's no way around it. It's going to be quite a long video, a lot of me talking. So uh, but stick around. This is some cool stuff and uh, I'll show some images throughout that I've made over the last couple weeks that I'm really proud of. Um, today we're going to talk all about the gear required to make these images. Uh, next time I'll go over kind of my setup and workflow. I don't think I'm going to get to image tonight. It's kind of some high clouds. High clouds ruin everything. No reflected light, no astrophotography, but it is what it is. So let's get started and talk about the gear used to make what are called deep sky images. These are images of nebula and galaxies as opposed to images of planets. This setup is not great for imaging planets. You need a lot more focal length to image planets. So this is a typical setup or a, uh, a setup I use to get images of galaxies, nebula, things like that. So let's talk about the most important thing first and that is absolutely not the telescope. Uh, the most important part is the mount, and that is everything from the ground up to what holds the telescope. You've got here a tripod pier, which is very, very stable. Um, but really, the most important part is from here up. That is what rotates with the night sky. It's called an equatorial mount. This specific mount is an Astrophysics Mach 1 GTO. I bought it used. Uh, it's a 2009 model, uh, but it still tracks the sky beautifully. So why is this the most important part? Well, you can have the best telescope, best camera in the world, but if you have a shaky mount, you're not going to get good images. Um, it's similar to if you have a wobbly tripod with a really long um, focal length lens for normal photography, you're not going to end up with the best images. Similar to this, it's very demanding. Astrophotography is probably the most demanding niche of photography that I've ever come across. Um, the thing about it, you're taking images of very faint objects. Most are so dim you can't even see them. Uh, you're taking images of a subject that's moving, so a moving target. Oftentimes your exposure length will be 5-10 minutes and you're at a relatively long focal length. We don't really talk about 35 millimeter equivalents uh, when it comes to astrophotography, but this whole setup is roughly 1200 millimeters if we were talking about 35 millimeter uh, equivalent. So imagine taking 1200 millimeters and tracking something for five minutes as it's moving and you can start to see why this is such a demanding uh, a demanding hobby. So I guess I'll talk a little bit about the theory of astro images, why we have to take so many pictures. Oftentimes you'll see that uh, my final image will be 12 hours of data, you know, 14, 20 hours of data, something like that. What I'm doing is I'm taking the same picture over and over, uh, usually five minute exposures at a time or 10 minute exposures at a time. Um, and then you take this picture of the same subject over and over again, and that adds to your total exposure time. Now, the reason we do that is because, again, we're taking uh, images of very, very faint nebula. If you're talking about a histogram, all your data is going to be smashed to the left side of the histogram where everything's dark. So in order to edit the images, to tease out those faint little details, you have to stretch the image. When you do that, you're emphasizing the noise in an image. So what uh, the reason we take multiple images is because noise is random. Uh, you'll have noisy pixels in one image, you take the same, pixel, same image of something else, those noisy pixels will rearrange. And because it is by definition random, if you take the same picture over and over and over again and then stack them together, that noise will average out. Meanwhile, your detail of the nebula or the galaxy is there continuously in the picture. So when you stretch it, that's the part of the image that will brighten and the noise will, again, average itself out. That's why we take, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70 or more images of the same subject over and over again is to get rid of that noise. Let's talk about how this mount works a little bit. That's kind of the theory of astrophotography. This mount moves in two axes. As you're setting it up, first you have to balance it. You've got these counterweights here that balance with the telescope itself and then you balance your telescope 
front to back. Once you find your image in the sky, this moves about two axes. This axis right here points to the North Celestial Pole. A uh, little fun fact here, the very fact that this works is a complete debunk of the flat Earth. If you've watched my channel, you'll know why that's important to me, but this only works on a globe, so that's a little aside there. But once you get this lined up with the North Celestial Pole, which is not the North Star, in fact, for our application, it's not even really close to the North Star. But what it will do is, only moving on this axis, once you find your object, it will track it as the night sky rotates. It's very important as you're taking, again, these five, 10 minute exposures so you don't start to get, so you don't get any star trails. So that is how the equatorial mount works. This is your most important uh, piece of equipment. If you are getting in this for the first time, this is where you want to spend your money. All right, so let's move on to the telescope itself. This is my telescope. It is an astrophysics 130 Starfire GTX. Love that name, Starfire. Uh, the 130, let's talk about that. 130 is actually the aperture of this front element or front lens. When we're talking about telescopes, we're talking about the diameter of the opening of the telescope as opposed to the focal length. Uh, focal length of this telescope is 819 millimeters. It is an f6.3 uh, telescope, which sounds slow if you're used to normal lenses, but 6.3 is decently fast. Um, this is a refractor telescope, which means it doesn't use mirrors. It's got a lens in the front here that focuses the light to your camera back here. Uh, the really cool thing about this telescope is uh, you can't just go buy it off the shelf. It actually has a seven to eight year waiting period. So uh, it's been about nine years ago now. I put my name in the list to get the telescope thinking uh, if I ever want it one day, it'd be a cool thing to have. Uh, thought they had forgot about it, but uh, yeah, about eight years afterward, they emailed me saying my name had come up in the queue and it was ready. So I bought it and it, it's just cool because you feel like you've kind of earned it a little bit. Anyway, F6.3 telescope, reasonably fast, but what I've added back here is what we call a telecompressor or a focal reducer. That takes it down to 4.5, which is actually pretty fast for a telescope. It also reduces the focal length to 585 millimeters. Now that's important because when you have a wider field of view, shorter focal length, wider field of view, your tracking doesn't have to be as precise. Um, it's like holding a wide angle lens and shaking a little bit versus holding a zoom lens and shaking a little bit. You can get by with a little bit of movement when your lens is wider. Same exact principle with a telescope. So that makes those 10 minute exposures a little bit more forgiving. So telescope 130 Starfire GTX, um, really, really well built telescope. We'll swing around to the back of the camera. This rather uninspiring red brick is the camera that I use. It is an Attic 383L Plus Mono, an equally uninspiring name for a camera. This is a one inch CCD sensor in there. Um, and again, that tells you kind of the scale you're dealing with. A one inch sensor is considered large format in astronomy world. Um, it's a CCD sensor, as I mentioned. That's different than your CMOS sensors that are in uh, basically every camera out today. Um, your DSLRs, mirrorless, cell phones, those are all CMOS, which stands for complementary metal oxide semiconductor as opposed to CCD charge couple device, I think. Anyway, that's not important, but for a long time, CCDs were kind of the standard for astrophotography. Now those CMOS cameras are coming along and really starting to make a big difference, but these CCD cameras still hold their own. Uh, all it has is two, um, two inputs here. There's a USB cable and a power cable, and that's it. It's all run by computer, so like I said, it's kind of an uninspiring camera. It's also a fully mono camera. So why do we use a mono camera? Um, well, all sensors are actually mono. When you take your normal CMOS uh, sensors and your DSLRs, there's actually a bare matrix over the top of that. And that is what gives you your color image. It's a series of microscopic filters on top of the pixels. There's a red, two greens, and a blue, and light coming in goes through that filter, and that's what gives you a color image. This is a completely monochrome sensor. There's no filters in front of it. What that does is make it, it gives you much sharper images. It's one of the advantages of monochrome 
uh, CCDs. You get a very sharp image, even though it's only an 8.3 megapixel uh, camera, which is not a lot, but it's enough and enough to give sharp images. So advantages of CCD, like I said, very sharp images, very predictable noise readout, very low noise, in fact. Um, but the predictable noise readout averages out really cleanly when you take multiple images over and over. Uh, it has a cooler on it. This particular camera can cool 40 degrees Celsius below ambient temperature. So oftentimes it's a pretty comfortable night. I'll be imaging at negative 20 degrees Celsius, which is, uh, gives you an even cleaner image with regard to noise. Disadvantages of these CCD cameras, one, they've actually discontinued almost all of them. These are very rarely made anymore, so it's kind of a defunct technology. Um, and as far as price goes, they're still pretty expensive um, for the sensor size. This is a one inch sensor and you can get this new, it's still $2,000, which is a lot of money for a one inch, eight megapixel sensor, if you think about it. I bought this one refurbished. It's, uh, it's held up well over time. Uh, last disadvantage would be, it's a very slow uh, readout time. So when you take a picture in a DSLR, your memory card or whatever reads that entire image off the sensor. Well, with a CCD sensor, it reads it one line at a time. So oftentimes it'll take 12 seconds or more to read off an eight megapixel image. And that's a lot when you're trying to take 70, 80, uh, 90 images a night. Um, that download time really adds up. With all that being said, still a very, very good camera, very stable, low noise, gives really clear images. And um, yeah, CCDs, they may not make them anymore, but if you can get your hands on one, it will take good astro images. But how do we get color out of it? Well, this black kind of circle here is your filter wheel. It's got a clear filter and then red, green, and blue, and then another specialized astronomy filter in there. Um, these filters, the way you take a series of images is you take images through your red, your red filter, your green filter, and your blue, blue filter. In software, you stack those all together and that's what gives you your final color image. It's like if you go into Photoshop and open up the channels tab, all of the um, all those images are going to be black and white but when you stack them all together that gives you color color image same process here you're just doing it manually the reason that gives you a clearer image is because you're using the entire sensor for all the red data the entire sensor for the green entire sensor for the blue as opposed to a color sensor with that bare matrix in front of it that's splitting the light into all the different colors so you're not getting the true resolution for each channel so you can get some really crisp images, like I said, when you're still limited uh, in your megapixels. So that is how we get color images out of a monochrome sensor. It's also how all of your cameras, all the sensors are monochrome, but uh, that filter in front of it splits the pixels up, splits the light up, and that's how you get color images from all sensors, which are monochrome. Fun fact. Not really fun though. Okay, so that's really the big components your mount, most important, your telescope, and camera. Uh, like I said, I've also got a focal reducer on here. Uh, that's similar to your Metabone speed booster, the way that works. Let's go over some of the auxiliary items that are very, uh, very helpful to have. So this whole setup actually has three cameras on it. Second camera here is this little tube that sticks up here. That's called a guide camera. The reason that's necessary is because I don't care how well your mount is manufactured, how well it's tracking that night, you're still going to have variations that could lead to star trails. So the way this guide camera works is you tell it to lock on a specific star and if it detects any movement in that star it sends a pulse to your mount telling it to correct for it. So it's sticking up because it has a little prism that sticks down into the imaging train, picks off just a little bit of light, just enough to give you a couple stars, and it locks onto one, and in almost real time, it's, or actually in real time, it's sending corrections to your mount if it detects even sub-pixel movements in the stars. And um, that really, really is a necessary piece of equipment. You can take what's called unguided images um, for you know maybe up to a minute or two if you're using a really wide angle lens, but if you wanna go really deep sky and get those five, 10, 15 plus minute exposures, you've really gotta have this piece of gear here. 
this rather uninspiring black box here is actually my autofocus. This was a complete game changer as far as going uh, completely automated, which was the goal. Um, while I do like sitting out by my telescope at night, um, it does get kind of long and tiring. So having autofocus lets you set everything up in software and then go to sleep. The reason you have to have autofocus, you can't just set your focus and then forget it, is because over time as the night air cools, the whole telescope itself will actually contract. So you can start with good focus and because things are actually changing physical dimension, you can end the night out of focus. Now the way this works, it's not like autofocus in a normal camera. The objects we're shooting are way too dim to actually focus on them. Um, a little bit complicated to describe here, but I'll do my best. You do have to get your telescope in reasonably good focus to begin with. Um, and you do that either by eyeballing it or uh, there's a couple different devices we have to help get into focus. But once that's in focus, it's all software controlled. But this box here is only, all it is is a motor that moves in very, very specific increments. So when you're in best focus, the focusing routine that's controlled by software will actually rack this, um, your imaging train here, your, uh, your tube, it will actually take it beyond focus. When you do that, your stars actually bloat a little bit it will say go seven steps past focus. It'll take a picture. And on an XY graph, reading how big your stars are and the position of the focuser, it will plot a point. And then it'll move the focuser back in. Again, a very specific amount. It will take another picture and the stars will be a little bit smaller because they're getting closer to focus. Eventually it'll do that until the stars are pinpoint, but it doesn't stop there. It will move actually closer into focus and so your stars start getting bigger again and it plots those points as your star gets bigger. It'll do that for seven, eight steps. But you plot the lines or you draw a line between all the points from those where your uh, camera is beyond focus and for those when it has gone even closer than focus. And that forms a V and where those lines intersect is perfect focus. Uh, I'll try to throw a picture of that up. It's more difficult to explain than it actually is in real life. But that is how you get autofocus. You run that, you know, every hour or so to make sure you're dealing with changes in your, uh, in your telescope. This was a huge deal to get. Okay, real quick because I'm running out of light. Um, this is the third camera up front here. That's called a Pole Master. Not necessary, but very handy to have. As you're setting up, probably the most critical task is very, very precisely aligning this right ascension um, axis here with the North Celestial Pole. Before this camera came out, that routine would take half an hour or more. But with this, it takes about three minutes. Super easy and very, very precise. All it does is once you're pointing roughly in the area of Polaris, the North Star, this recognizes exactly where it's pointing and then it will give you small movements to make to your telescope. And the way we make those movements are actually physically on the telescope itself. I think you can see that. There's two knobs toward the back and one in the front. Those move it left and right. That's called your azimuth. And then your altitude knob up here moves it, physically moves it up and down until you're dead on that North Celestial Pole. That's a huge deal. That really changed astrophotography, made it a lot easier. Um, last few things here. I know this looks like a mess on top, but this is actually very well uh, organized. Cable management is a huge deal with astrophotography. All this stuff has to be powered and has to have a USB connection. And so you can imagine you can have the potential for a lot of dangling wires that can get tangled as this is moving overnight. Not good because if that tangles then it messes up your tracking. So I have all this run on top here with just one USB cable and one power cable and then from the top I distribute it everywhere else. One thing about astrophotography, you have to be a little bit of a tinker. All this gear is different, most of it came used, and you have to get all that to talk to each other to mount or to attach to the mount. So you have to be kind of willing to either cut on metal or splice wires together. But that's how all that came together. In addition, this focuser is so old that it doesn't even hook up through USB, it's through a serial port. The reason astrophotography is so frustrating is because 
you just have not dealt with frustration and so it's one in the morning and your computer randomly forgets what a serial port is and you have to direct it to where you're focused. Uh, just the worst. Not actually the worst, but you get where I'm going. But uh, that's why it can be frustrating. When it all comes together though, you create images that nobody really gets to see. So it is a very, very rewarding uh, hobby if you can make it past the frustration. So this is my setup. It's what I use. Certainly, um, it, it's, it's not the cheapest thing to get into, um, but you can buy used, which is what I did for most of this. Astronomers tend to take very good care of their gear, and uh, you can go to cloudynights.com or astromart.com and get, uh, get a lot of your gear there. The good thing is the universe doesn't go anywhere, so you got plenty of time to build this setup. Um, once I put my name in for the telescope, I just, over the period of about seven or eight years, I'd collect a piece of gear here and there and uh, eventually built the setup that, that you see here today. You certainly don't have to go with as high end amount. Um, if you're using a wider lens, you can get a uh, less expensive mount. Those wider lenses are more forgiving. If you want to just use a DSLR and a camera to see if this is a hobby you'd be interested in, they actually make an Astro Tracker, which is I think five or 600 bucks, which in the scheme of photography gear is actually not that much. Um, it tracks the night sky, not as precisely as this, but you don't need precision because even a 200 millimeter lens is really wide uh, when it comes to astrophotography. So, like I said, guys, that is my setup. That's what I use. If you have any questions about gear, let me know in the comments below. I'm sorry it was kind of a dry video, but I really don't know of any way to talk about gear and make it exciting. Like I said, it is a large format video because this camera is large format. The sky is clearing. I may get the image tonight. We'll see. But uh, next time we'll go over all the setup. The software I use, software is a huge deal in this as well. Um, the fortunate thing, I'll close with this, um, software is not super expensive and you don't have to have a high-end computer to run it. You can have a pretty, pretty low spec computer. So that's one part of the hobby that is cheap. Um, I'm gonna show some images and then the outro was from three days ago, but it shows uh, some of the work I do and how the telescope ends up after a night of imaging. Thanks for watching guys. See you next time. Okay, so here we are the following morning. I want to show you a couple things or a few things I didn't mention last night. First, this is my makeshift do cover for the computer here. But here's what we were capturing last night. There's two galaxies there. And I captured 71 five minute exposures of that. So that's a really good night of imaging. Um, the telescope winds up in its parked position there. So um, everything looks like it went well. <laughs> Here's here's the best part. So we've got these street lamps and obviously light pollution is bad. So I set up a curtain on some light stands and some PVC pipe. Uh, very classy here in Tennessee. Last story. Um, the first time I set this up in my driveway, it's been a couple years ago now, I got the cops called on me. Um, we live in just this really rural area on a cul-de-sac and I set up my telescope there and about a few hours later I noticed a cop circling the neighborhood here. There's no reason for a cop to be out here. Um, we live in, like I said, a cul-de-sac out in the farmland. So, granted, it does kind of look like a rocket launcher, but I always thought that was funny. Got the cops called on me.
officially, I don't know who did it unofficially. Make sure I'm pointing. It's that guy right there. So, anyway, it looks like a successful night of imaging. I spot checked uh, a few of those 71 images. All the stars looked on point. Um, so, that was another 355 minutes of data there. It was all the uh, clear filter last night. So, uh, later on, I'll add the red, green, and blue filters to add the color. What I took last night gets all those faint details, brings those in. We'll talk about that in processing. I may try to get some more sleep. Thanks for watching, guys. See you next time.